Uh, welcome to our June meeting of the Black County Historical Society. Appreciate you being here this evening. Uh, once in a while, we have someone who has something which is called a show and tell. But does anyone have any particular thing they've brought tonight they'd like to mention to the group or any announcements or anything that uh, would like to mention? Uh, so, um, we appreciate your attendance tonight. And uh, so I'm, we do have a few announcements we'd like to make. Uh, I want to ask Elizabeth Hurd to come up and talk with us just a minute or two on Pioneer Village. And uh, we've got a real exciting thing coming up, but I'm not going to spoil it. I'm going to let Elizabeth talk about it. But I'm very excited about it. This is a great crowd tonight. Good to see all of you here. We have some exciting things going on at Pioneer Village. We have been doing field trips since before school was out, and we've done, uh, I think, about 10 so far. And we have another one this week, and they're always a lot of fun. We enjoy the kids, and you never know what they're going to say. So it's, it's always a, a fun time. Next month, we have, uh, on July the 10th, you might want to write this down. We have the Arkansas 10 Lizzie Auto Club coming to Pioneer Village. They're convening in Heber Springs and they're going to actually drive their vehicles, not haul them. They're going to drive them down from Heber to Pioneer Village. They're going to eat their lunch there. I don't know how long some of this is going to work, but this is the plan. They're going to eat their lunch there and actually tour the village and their vehicles will be available for viewing while the time that they're there. They plan to be there between 11 and 1. So if you want to see some antique vehicles, this will be a great opportunity. They tell me there will be 25 to 30 vehicles coming. So we plan to let them park inside the village, up around the building, so I, that will be quite some um, Scenes, I think, would make some good pictures for you if you'd be interested in that. Another exciting thing happening at Pioneer Village is they have started construction of our restrooms. And we are so excited about that. Yay! They, um, I think, unless this happened this afternoon, um, and it hadn't when I passed by there earlier today, um, they have the plumbing in and they're ready to pour the slab. So any day, if it didn't happen today, any day they'll be pouring the slab. So it's moving right along. We have already purchased some uh, rough cut wood for the exterior of the building. And it's on site just waiting to get some walls to put it in. So if you don't come to see us until the fall open house, you'll have a real restroom to use this time with hot running water. Now, where else can you beat that? Now, I have to get on Elizabeth just a little bit because <laughs> some of these, our folks are a little too young to know what 10 Lizzie's are. Mr. Langford, explain 10 Lizzie's to us, please. 10 what? 10 Lizzie's. What's a 10 Lizzie? Well, it's a much used model T. <laughs> <laughs> so uh, well, I just thought. Day, okay. Any early 20s or 30 model car. Okay. And been used a whole lot. Been used a whole lot. And so. you got you have to crank them. Okay, I knew you'd be able to explain it to us. So. I it right here. <laughs> That's why I picked on you. <laughs> uh, thank you, Elizabeth. Uh, and all the other mistakes you made, I don't think we're getting restrooms. I think we're getting outhouses myself. It's right here, Bill. So, uh, but they are going to have to run in water, so I guess maybe she's correct. Um, uh, Ms. Uh, has to do everything. Oh, just, there we are. <laughs> I'm sorry. Uh, I think the uh, Civil War Roundtable is dismissed for the summer. That's correct. Okay, so we don't have anything. Again, okay, and I don't see Tom Bird here on Sons of Confederate Veterans. Uh, 
don't believe we have anything going. I probably have something going, but I'm not aware of it. Um, anyone from DAR have anything to report? Um, Georgia, what's going on in romance? Uh, the romance reunion will be the 11th. The 11th. It's a Saturday, we, and we'll meet in the fellowship hall at the Romance Church of Christ. Okay. What's the usual attendance as a rule? A couple hundred? Uh, it's usually close to 100. About 100. Okay. Uh, we it, don't get as many from far away as we used to. Yeah. Uh -huh. But still need to have a community reunion. So I'm, I'm, I'm glad y'all continue that. And if you want to see the waterfalls, he always opens it up for visitors to go and look at it and whatever. You just can't get in it. <laughs> <laughs> I just stay out of the waterfall. Huh? So, uh, the, um, well, I want to also mention, and uh, you're certainly welcome tonight, if you are interested in joining the White County Historical Society, our annual dues are $20. And, uh, Elizabeth will take your money and help the forms. I don't want to be pushy there, but at the same time, we do welcome new members. Um, our program tonight, I'm really excited about. If you have a connection with any part of northern White County, like Holly Springs, Stealth Rock, Little Red, uh, Roosevelt, uh, etc., would you mind standing up if you have a connection to the community? And then I actually Denmark. Well, okay, Denmark's kind of foreign, but we'll leave that to Denmark <laughs> all the way across the creek. Let's see, that's across uh, Ten Mile Creek, isn't it? So, um, because I know I have never aged in the last 20 or 30 years, but I'm going to ask people just real quick to give your names if you have a connection to the community. You don't have to give anything except your name, but there may be someone here that you knew years ago. And you haven't changed, but maybe they have. Ms. Miller, I'm going to start with you. Clara Proud Miller. My donation was Matt Fadden family. Matt Fadden family. Dr. Oldham. Bill Oldham, Mom Oldham, my wife. And for a short 16 and a half years, we were ministers at the uh, Stephon Church of Christ and had the unique pleasure and joy of being good friends with Boyce and and the family. Being here. Uh, Appreciate your being here, Dr. Oldham. Uh, Faye? Well, uh, mine's Faye, but it's Faye Lake Jones. So the Lake family was from the right here. The Lake family, L-A-P-E, right? Uh -huh. Okay. I'll see this game from Stepford, well, Stepford, Holly Springs, and Roosevelt. I was born and raised there. And if your last name is King, you may have a connection to King Mountain. I really know where King Mountain is. My ex-husband lived there. <laughs> Appreciate your being here. I'm David Morris, and I'm part of the Morris family. Denmark, relatives of, obviously, of Morris and Adele and their descendants. And I'm Betty Morris, Rainwater. I'm his aunt and their cousin. <laughs> See, you're getting claimed here. <laughs> <laughs> everyone will be here tonight, but I thought it has been a while. One of the things that we don't get to do too often in the Historical Society is focus on our small communities. And yet that's where much of our history is. So uh, I just thought I'd like to take a chance here and uh, make sure that everybody uh, is aware who else is here from the community. Um, one of the strengths of a local historical society is the preservation of community history just as a family may have the go-to person for the family's history, rural communities usually have a go-to person for the community history. When a community is really fortunate, the history is not only oral, but also written down. Fortunately, for all of White County, the northern part of our, the county will be our presentation tonight. Um, Exactly 10 years ago, June of 2005, these same two ladies who will be with us tonight were with us to present the first edition of Chips from the Woodyard, a collection, the first edition being out of print. However, thanks 
Through their dedication and hard work, a second is now available. As an additional note, Ms. Lakita, did I say your name correctly? It's all right. <laughs> I, have, I have trouble every time. I see her name in print constantly because we do a bunch of emailing, and then I forget that. I should double check one thing. Is it Lakeisha instead? Lakeisha. Lakeisha. I'm sorry. Lakeisha uh, Wood Kent is from the Washington, D.C. area. And her sister, Mariola Wood Payne, is from Dover, not Delaware, Arkansas. Still quite a ways, 100 miles, I would say, is it is. <laughs> but they have traveled quite a distance to be with us tonight. And um, I think, we're, I know we're in for a very enjoyable evening. They've asked for two podiums. And unfortunately, Harding Place only has one microphone. So they're going to have to see how well two sisters share. So it's going to come down to here. <laughs> but with that, could we have a warm White County welcome for our speakers tonight? I've been schooled in folk medicine as thoroughly as I thought. 
The article stated that the Madstone is a cure for snake bite. In all these years, I've known it to be the cure for rabies. Well, everyone knows that for snake bite, you grab a live chicken, slit it open, and quickly put it on the bite to draw out the poison. So now I'm faced with sorting through all my old standby remedies to find out if there are others that are so fickle, I just can't trust them anymore. <coughs> Will a drop of blood from a messy bug not stop the earache? Or hot wood ashes dissolved in water not cure lockjaw? No more scraped Irish potato or piece of fat meat or a wool or sty. And for asthma, must I use something other than a muskrat skin with the fur side worn next to the patient's skin? And I have always removed something from the eye with a horsehair loop and then taken cod liver oil in a glass of water from a vessel in which nails were rusty. It makes the oil taste like something else. <laughs> we always knew when there was no doctoring in the house and could almost identify the ailment by the smells, like mashed onion poultices for the fruit and the acephitica bags or worn on a string around the neck to ward off contagious diseases. One reason the bags were so effective was that no one could bear to get close to the wearer to pinch himself <laughs> in the jars. Some people use mystic powers to stop the flow of blood and remove wards. But Brandon didn't call them such powers. Except that a person who had never seen his father could cure a, thr cure a thrash by blowing his breath into the child's infected mouth. Then there was sugar and soot to stop bleeding. Most of these injuries healed over the soot, which left a big black scar the rest of your life. And a wart was pricked with a pen until it bled. The blood bled. The blood smeared on a grain of corn. Then the corn fed to a chicken. I don't know if the chicken grew the wart in its craw or if it just mysteriously vanished. Special emphasis seemed to be on the children in the home clinic. And the major thought was, if a little will do good, then a lot will do better. <laughs> Each spring, it seemed that gallons of sassy grass tea was consumed as a tonic, somewhat akin to present-day vitamins. A big dose of sulfur and molasses daily for a month was a must to thin the blood that had thickened to withstand the winter's cold. It also drove out the poisons that had accumulated during the year. A couple of grown-ups in our community got together each spring for a bleeding to get rid of the old used blood and start a new cycle, like an oil change in a car. Once, they almost didn't get it stopped in time, which scared them into no more bloodletting sessions. And a good Persian, purging with calomel was a must to stir up the liver and get rid of the bile. Too much bile caused cholera morbus, an upset stomach or today's intestinal virus. It was of little concern that the calomel often salivated the mouth and permanently damaged the teeth or caused them to draw a bile. Whether we needed it or not, we children were given quinine or chill tonic just to get a head start on a future bout of something. All of this prepared us for the summer, when peach tree leaf, dock, sweet gum, elderberry, and broom corn teas took priority for whatever did or didn't fail a person. Homemade lye was put on an infected sore, and a good chew of tobacco or a dip of snuff was plastered on the bee sting immediately. Toothaches were treated by smoking a cigarette made with coffee grounds. And little boys got Toothaches a lot of times. <laughs> <laughs> when I was seven years old and spending the night with my aunt, I kept the whole household awake, crying with an aching stone bruise. My uncle, probably losing patient and wanting a little sleep, got up about one o'clock, dressed, did his oil lantern, took the fire shovel to the barn, and scooped up a big, fresh wall of cow manure, and had Aunt Lenore to plaster it thickly on my foot. And she managed that with a cloth to keep it intact, as well as for protection to the bed linens. By two o'clock, everyone was sound asleep. When I washed the cow dung off my foot the next morning, the swelling and soreness was almost gone, and the stone bruise caused me no more discomfort. For my granny and others of the pioneer era, the knowledge of herbs and home remedies was a must, and were taken very seriously. Some remedies now seem foolish and unsanitary to the point of being dangerous, such as cobweb pills for malaria and willowbark tea for headache, 
or the skin of a fat boiled toad for chest pains. I believe to look at this would scare away anybody, but research has proven that some of these remedies do contain some medicinal elements. The practice of folk medicine was the forerunner of today's modern medicine, and all the dosings, teas, poultices, and liniments did not prevent most of us from growing up healthy and energetic, which is a tribute to the capabilities and determination of our pioneer grandparents. That we grew up at all took a great deal of determination on our part. <laughs> Actually, I don't think they sound any worse than some of the things modern medicine gives us today. <laughs> and that is the first story we're going to read. Our second reading is from the Little Red River Journal, and it is one we've read before, the story of Mother's Wedding. I kind of wanted to read about the chickens in the book. It's too long, but it's about, it is about as funny as it is. This is our favorite to read because it's funny. It was our um, It's called If the Creek Don't Rise. <coughs> Sunday, December 6, 1936, had to be one of the wettest days in history. According to plans, it was to be my wedding day. The rain began before daylight, not a gentle shower. It came down in a steady deluge all morning. The yard, when I could see through the downpour, looked like a lake, and all the ditches were muddy, raging torrents filled with floating debris. I spent the morning looking out the windows and rechecking the bag I had packed. Packing my trousseau had only taken a few minutes. There was only a couple of changes of clothes and a few articles like a toothbrush, a comb, and bath powder. But I kept looking to see if I'd forgotten something, just to give my fidgety hands something to do. I passed by my dress on the hanger and looked to see if I could find a wrinkle that needed pressing out then take a closer look at it to see if the color was really blue or purple. I never could decide which color it was. The mail order company explained that due to popular demand for the material of my choice, the supply was exhausted. And rather than disappoint me, they were sending this substitute, which was of equal or greater value. Of course, there was no time to reorder. I can't remember my shoes, but I think they were black. On my mind, too, was an old saying I'd heard Grant repeat many times. A bride must shed as many tears as the drops of rain that fall on her wedding day. <laughs> For that many tears, I'd need to start now to get a good head start on my crying. Only I was too disgusted with the rain to cry. It only would stop at 2 o'clock in the afternoon. That was the time we had agreed on. It did slow down to a light sprinkle. At about one o'clock, I saw my cousin come sloshing across the field to tell me I was wanted on the phone. What now, I thought, knowing full well who the call was from. Questions kept coming to my mind. Like had he gotten beat at the last minute and decided to call the whole thing off? Or was there something wrong with that old car? I couldn't think his sister was calling me to tell me he was sick or hurt. But it was silly to ask questions for which there were no answers as yet. And anyway, I needed all the concentration I could muster to keep my lo from losing my old boots to the sucking, squishing mud. Every step was a tug of war. I gave the crank of the phone the proper amount of turns for his number, one long and two short. Then, hello? Hello. Sorry it took me so long. It's tough walking in the mud. Yeah, I know. Listen, I saddled a horse and rode down to the creek. I can't cross. It's about 15 <coughs> feet over the road. Darn it. I'd completely forgotten that silly creek. With any big rainstorm, it flooded and got over the road, and we lived on opposite sides of it. There's a song about a creek rising that always reminds me of my wedding day. Oh, are you still there? Yeah. Well, what do you want to do? Wait till next Sunday? No. It's already too near Christmas. Somehow, I did not want my wedding to fall on or near a holiday. What about Tuesday night? Is that okay? Yeah, I guess so. You still not want anyone to go with us? No, I don't. I might do or say something silly. You got anything else to say now? I guess not. Why? Well, this phone will grow out any minute. The line is almost in the water at the creek. And when it touches the water, it's out. I'll see you next Tuesday night if the creek don't rise. It was getting late when he got there Tuesday night. 
He grabbed my bag and said, we had to hurry. Why the hurry, I asked, when we were on our way? Because when this is over, I have to go to Prince's, his brother, to get a truck to haul some pigs to the sale barn tomorrow. Why didn't you just start earlier tonight? Buck and I saw the stage folks today, and he didn't want to stop until we got another load cut. I gave up trying to get it all straight, because the road we were on seemed to be all we could concentrate all the time. He had his hands full with the driving, and I was beginning to feel uneasy with the road's conditions. Just after we crossed the creek, the road turned to follow the creek bank up the hollow, where we crossed a smaller creek, then went up a hill. At best, the road was only a rugged wagon trail that looked like a tunnel between the steep, bluff rock walls and was so narrow the tree limbs touched it overhead. The recent rains and flooding had made it even worse, with more holes and gullies and boulders we had to maneuver around. I thought every minute we would get stuck in a hole, bust the bottom of the car, break a wheel, or at least get a flat tire. I sat as rigid and tense as a stone all the way, dreading the long, rough walk to some place, when and if we stall it to go no further. How in the world could any car withstand the beating that old roaster was taking? I breathed a sigh of relief when we finally turned off a side road, and Boyd said, There it is. By peering through the trees, I could see a dim light at the top of another little hill. When he stopped the car and we got out in front of the house, I felt sure I could fix the little car settle down to relax after his fierce battle with the road. I decided it would be best that we didn't ask anyone else along. For I doubt if the car could have made it with one added pound in the lumber seat. After a few impatient knocks at the front door, we could hear the justice of the peace stumbling over furniture as he came through the dark, cracked room to the door. When he opened the door, boy said, Mr. Brown, will you marry us really quick? Why? You two running away? Mr. Brown asked, scanning the road behind us to see if there was a bob coming. No, just in a hurry, answered boy. Well, come on in. Come in out of the car, he said, then slapped his leg and had a good laugh. I don't remember one word of the ceremony. Mr. Brown mumbled a few indistinct words, then he laughed, and he mumbled some more words. Then his wife said to me, Honey, you're supposed to say I do. After his wife had signed as our witness, Mr. Brown said that the refreshments were in order. He took a lantern, some glasses, and boys down to his cellar to turn his own special wine, which he made from grapes he grew in his vineyard. While they were out, Mrs. Brown told me not to drink but a sip. I knew Mr. Brown's wine by reputation, that a little went a long way. <laughs> Since I don't like the wine anyway, I only pretended for his benefit. And as a finale, Mr. Brown proposed a toast to the bride, and we were on our way back down the holler. Downhill, it seemed faster. When we got home to Boyce's mother's house, he took my bag and led the way inside and lit a lamp. He asked me if I'd changed my mind about going to Prince's for the truck. No, I did not really want to meet his brother's family yet. I did venture to ask why he and Prince were in such a hurry to sell the 115 pigs they bought only a few days ago. Well, they've not been vaccinated. i got to hurry now before Prince goes to bed. I'll be back in 30 minutes, he said as he went out the door. I dug my nightgown out, debated whether to pull the shade down, and decided I'd better not, as they might be the kind of lay out your hand and make a big noise, or unroll completely all the way to the floor. I blew out the light, undressed quickly, and got into bed. It was just too cold the dog was set up and wait for the voices return. I had scarcely gotten into bed when I was jarred upright by a sudden melee and clamor woofing and squealing, dogs barking and growling, and such a thumping and bumping it shook the bed I was in. I was sure some of them were under my bed, not daring to risk my feet over the side for fear of sharp teeth would grab a leg. I carefully climbed over the footboard and gingerly set my feet on the floor to look underneath. Of course nothing was under the bed. Where I was standing, I could feel the floor bounce as it gave to a hard bumping underneath. In the bright moonlight, I could see several pigs running around and woofing in the yard. They had lost the battle, but not for long. They spent the night squealing and fighting with the dogs over who was going to sleep in the holes the dogs had dug underneath the house. With the bumping on the sills, it took the house so violently it shuddered and the windows rattled. 
Any minute, I thought, a dog or a pig would be flung through into the inside. After a long time, I decided I'd better try to ignore the body and snuggle down to keep from freezing. The boss would be back real soon, and he could shoot them away. All of a sudden, there was quiet for a few minutes. Good, I thought. I have gone to the pig pen, maybe. I relaxed and shut my eyes, glad of the hush after so much noise. But in the stillness, I felt something unusual, a creepy feeling. Oh, it's nothing, I thought. I'm just tense. Still, the feeling persisted, and I finally opened my eyes for a quick peek, not daring to move a muscle. I saw a mule's head, not two feet from my face. He was looking in the window. Had it not been for the glass, I could have touched his nose from where I was lying. Hey, what should I do now? Any movement on my part might cause him to move his head just enough to break the window. Then he might think nothing was there to prevent him from poking his head inside anyway. I went up to the far side of the bed while he stood there staring at me. I called. Is he going to stand there all night? Where in the world is boys? Why are all the animals in the yard anyway? Who left all the gates open? After what seemed hours, the mule closed his eyes and seemed to sleep. His head nodding closer and closer, and I thought any minute he would topple into the window pane. But a rush of squealing pigs around his feet suddenly moved him to action, and he clumped across the yard and out of sight. Much later, a voice came in and explained that Prince's family had gone to a school program in the truck and he had to wait until they returned. As he undressed in the dark and got into bed, I knew he was tired after a long day, but I thought he should know there were animals all over the place and trying to turn the house over, as if he could not hear them. But he was half asleep when he came in. Boys, mm -hmm. there's a herd of hogs under the house, and a mule too. He peeked in the window at me. Yeah, we turned in this morning. What did that mean? He was too tired and sleepy to be concerned about it, I supposed. What I didn't know then was that the people living in the little delta on this side of the creek had a sort of unwritten law that everyone turned the stock into the fields to forage after the crops were gathered. On my side of the creek, no one allowed livestock outside the fences. Our few pigs for meat lived in pens, and we fed them slop, and our mules lived in the barn. I couldn't sleep in a place broad with animals. Oh well, if you could ignore them, I would too, I thought, and tried to calm down. But just then a new noise erupted to compete with the pigs and the dogs. A loud bellowing and bawling right in the front of the house brought me both upright again. In the moonlight, I could see two huge bulls that met to settle the argument as to who was boss. They were too close to the front porch for comfort. It looked and sounded so fierce with all the button and a balling and a paw and dirt over the bikes. I was sure they were killing, or at least crippling each other. The way they biked off and made battering runs at each other, one might butt the other into the wall, too. Boys, hmm? Do something. Huh? They'll kill each other. What? The bulls, just listen to them. No, they won't. Go to sleep. Sleep? Who can sleep with all that right now? But they finally did end the budding and bellowing, or only took a reprieve. They made off in different directions, grumbling back and forth as if still calling each other dirty names until they were out of hearing. Another round of bumping and fighting into the house, which made the bed shudder like an earthquake, was too much for me. Boys. Huh? Do you have a storm cellar? Gosh, it's as clear as a bell outside, and now you want a storm cellar. No, we ain't got one. Well, it was just an idea. If the house gave way from one of the onslaughts, I'd make a dash for the cellar rather than be trampled and maybe bitten by the animals. But then, maybe I'd better stop asking questions or I'd be considered backward. From now on, I'd just play it by ear, keep my eyes open, and learn my way around. The explanations I'd been getting were none too clear anyway. Come to think of it, though, there was a place I could run to if it came to a showdown, the bar. It was surely unoccupied now. With that comforting thought in mind, I could relax a little. Just as I thought I had myself under control, some inner alarm system caused Boyce to stir and waken. He wiggled out of bed and into his clothes. And I wondered, what in heaven's name is he going to do at this hour? 
The moon was almost gone, and I could hear roosters crowing in a new day. And voice said, I'll eat breakfast after you caught the pigs, and was brought out the back door. By watching, I soon learned why the early rising. The pigs were stirring and had to be caught as they came out from under the house, or they would soon be so scattered no one could catch them. Friends came to help. They grabbed the leg, ear, or tail and hung on, carried the pig to the trunk and plugged him in, then rushed back for another pig. I was surprised that none of them were chewed up or had broken legs. They seemed none the worse for playing musical chairs or rather musical holes all night with the dogs. After they left with their noisy load, I wondered what I would do all day. And Boyce's mother came up with a plan. She told me that the turnips in the garden would freeze if they were not peeled up and suiting action to word, she set about the chore of peeling them. Like a beautiful daughter-in-law should, I offered to hell. We worked like beavers, pulling up dry grass for the bedding, uprooting bushels of turnips, cutting the tops off, and piling them in a mound on the grass. We pulled more grass for a thick covering over the turnips. Next, we spaded and spread a layer of dirt about eight inches thick to cover the whole thing. Packed and tamped it until it was smooth and nicely rounded. For even more protection from rain and dampness, we drove stakes into the ground and used tin to cover it, making a sort of lean to. This took most of the day and some sore hands and backs to get the job done. Boyce did not get home from the sail barn until we needed the supper, but the night was much quieter. No pigs to fight with the dogs, no peeping tom mule, and no bull arena in the front walk. The animals had moved on to the fields to find the food. In our area of the country, soon after a wedding, there had to be a chivalry to duly tie the knot. And in those days, chivalries were very noisy. They were always expected, but the day was kept secret to surprise the newlyweds. A huge crowd of friends would gather someplace and wait until they thought the couple were asleep, then quietly walked to the house. On a given signal, everyone suddenly made all the noise possible with any object they could think of and carry. Ringing bells, beating on tubs and plows, banging on the house with boards, whistling, yelling, and shooting guns. A good chivalry could be heard for miles. The noise makers usually circle the house three times, giving a couple time to get out of bed, light a lamp, and invite the crowd in for refreshments. Usually something like candy or popcorn balls were passed around. If the couple were caught unprepared and did not have anything for refreshments, the groom got a ride around the house on a fence rail. If no fence rail was happy, the bed was dismantled and the bed rail used for the ride. A chivalry was a party with lots of well-wishing and congratulations for the couple. Our chivalry was planned for the first night after the wedding and a gunshot was to be the signal for everyone to start the noise. But when the man fired the first shot into the air from his double barrel shotgun, a girl standing next to him fainted. We had to bring her inside, and it was about 30 minutes before she recovered sufficiently to go home. The gunshot was the beginning and the end of our chivalry. My wedding day was a washout. And the animals took charge of my reception, which was more like an initiation. But my chivalry was one big blast. <laughs> so began a marriage that lasted 63 years until our dad died in 2000. Mm -hmm. And it was all paid for by the end of it. <laughs> <laughs> Can you imagine the, uh, how much it costs for weddings nowadays? Oh. We'd like to end, especially, I hadn't planned, thought about reading this poem that Mother wrote. But since Miss Clara Bell is here and the Odoms are here, it's it's a meditation or more like a prayer. And Mother called it Who. Who whispers to the seeds we sow and tells each one it's time to grow. Who tells its petals to unfurl and spreads perfume to all the world. Who puts the color in the trees when comes the hazy or breeze. Who told the sun to light the day then placed stars in the Milky Way. Who told the bird that he could fly and soar above the clouds so high? Who tells him when it's time to go to nest where warmer waters flow? Who tells the chilling winds to blow and cool the earth with falling snow? 
Then who designs each fragile flame? Whose tender touch did each one make? What a pleasure to have you with us tonight. I'm deeply in your debt. We talked a little, and I thought of the word when we used chivalry. A, uh, I subscribed to what's called the Arkansas History List on the internet. And about two or three months ago, they had this huge discussion about what was a chivalry. Well, I've heard enough stories from my parents to know what a chivalry was, and y'all described it very well. And you've even attended one, okay. <laughs> so, uh, but it's little things like this that make our history, and it's the little things like this that die out. And uh, when you had a group of historians on the internet trying to figure out what a chivalry was, I thought, well, they need to look at Pike County history once in a while, because we've got two or three stories on chivalry. So, uh, but their work, uh, well, somewhere there'll be a, a child who hasn't come along yet. In a few years, they will pick up a book, and there's stories there of White County that need to be remembered. They're not big, uh, but it's just it's part of our history, and uh, so we really appreciate your work so much. Uh, books are available uh, after the program's over, and uh, twenty dollars. And uh, the uh, they're they're let me hold one up here. First of all, I like the color. My wife would buy this just because of the color. She wouldn't have anything, but uh, it's really, and of course, we were, oh boy, that'd be great to watch me juggle. But um, anyway, uh, the, uh, there's also maps in here. There's a lot of history of just the, uh, the background of the community. As we mentioned, we had, what year was Holly Springs, 1930? Did you work? 1930. And so, um, I'm gonna finish here in a minute, believe it or not, but anyway, I really appreciate over the years we've had different people who have been interested in different parts of the county. And the northern part of the county has really not been as well represented. And so uh, this fills in the gap in our history. But I do invite you to come up and look, and uh, I think it's a book you would enjoy. Um, ladies, we have, I think I got a complete set here of our White County cooking books, and uh, set for each of you here. We appreciate your coming so much. And uh, there's some stories in there. That... <laughs> oh, <laughs> Mr. Kim's here, okay. <laughs> do you have to do the cooking too? Sometimes. Sometimes. There's some good recipes in there. Um, thank you very much. Well, thank you so much. Um, if you did not sign in tonight, we have a good crowd. I don't think everybody signed in. We just like to keep a record on our numbers. And I'm going to move this over, I think just right here. If you didn't sign in and get a chance to come by, we'd appreciate it. Um, with that, I want to, there's, our program next month will be by Gary Lay. And a lot of you remember 50 years ago, I have to do my math right quick. I guess that was 1965. Uh, the missile silo fire at, I say, Clay or Albion area north, up close to where Highway 305 and Highway 16 come together. Uh, they were doing work on one of the missile bases, and there was a fire. 53 men were killed. Two men survived. One of them was an 18-year-old young man who was working to make money for college that fall, and he happened to be one of the survivors. Mr. Gary Lay is the gentleman, uh, lived in North Little Rock for years, and he will be, he doesn't talk about this very often, but he will be speaking about the missile silo fire on next month's meeting. So that, of course, will be fourth Monday. And um, it's, it'll be a more serious topic than we had tonight, but it's very much part of White County's history. So I invite you to remember that for the, um, for the July meeting. Um, Mr. Langford, I need a number between 1 and 43. 33. 33. Is that going to be your number? No. <laughs> it's uh, Kat, Kathleen Schultz. I, well, I don't uh, Just a book, a uh, door prize, a 
recipe book from the Gardner Fire Department. So we appreciate your being here. Um, are there any announcements that anyone thought of? If not, we invite you to stay around and visit. If you would like to look at books, they are available. And uh, we certainly appreciate several people coming to visit tonight. Uh, so uh, we thank you for coming. And with that, we're dismissed. <laughs>